So we've heard that feeding the seven billion who populate this planet and the few billion more who will soon join us is going to be an enormous challenge. But doing it sustainably without depleting our precious resources further, degrading our environment, this is going to be an even bigger challenge, especially in the face of climate change and all those challenges that uh, that will present. And of course, the good news is that agriculture, food production overall, is ripe for disruption, right? There's enormous opportunities for tightening efficiencies at every single level of the way. And this disruption, I hope some of the solutions will come from the innovative uh, work that's being done in engineering biological systems. So my goal in this short talk today is to introduce you to an algorithm for innovation, and that's called evolution. Yes, it's an algorithm for innovation, almost turning the crank to get amazing chemical novelty. And this is um, something that the biological world has done for four billion years of innovation and exploration leading to a truly stunning array of solutions to a very important problem, the problem of being alive and of enduring for billions of years, right? 150 years, I congratulate BASF on that existence, but billions of years of life come about through this amazing algorithm of evolution. And if you think about it, nature's the best chemist there is because these systems can extract materials and energy from the environment and convert it into self-reproducing, self-repairing, mobile, adapting, sometimes even thinking machines. Now, I find this system fascinating because if you think about it, all this functionality is written in the genomes. And you are going to hear some of the most remarkable advances that have happened technologically in our ability to rewrite those genomes, in fact, in this very session. And given this ability, we can start thinking about reprogramming the ultimate green chemical synthesis machine, that is something you could take off the bottom of your shoe, a simple microbe, to make everything from all the fuels and chemicals to the topic of this symposium, food ingredients, nutritional ingredients, agents, biologically active agents that will promote crop protection, promote growth of plants. So this capability is going to happen in our lifetimes, but it's, it's hard. And um, I'm, I deal with the catalyst, so I'm the parts lady in all this business. The parts being the catalyst, the genetically programmed protein catalyst that carry out all this amazing chemistry. And there's millions of them out there, literally presented to us on a silver platter that you can scrape off the bottom of your shoe. And there's many more to be discovered. But in this talk today, I want to talk about expanding this universe of truly stunning catalysts <coughs> to include some of the clever chemistry that humans have developed. In the lifetime of BASF, humans have invented, and I know many of you are some of those inventors, have invented really clever chemistry. And I would like to be able to break down the barriers between the biological and the chemical world and bring some of that amazing chemistry back into biology. What does this mean? This means expanding this already large universe of chemical catalysis uh, by enzymes. So here's the question that I'll pose for this talk. How do we, as human chemists, expand the space of chemistry by biology? Because we would like to be able to access things in more efficient routes than biology does it, or perhaps build metabolic pathways to access chemicals that we cannot currently make biologically. This is really hard. Writing new enzymes is very hard. Yes, the technology of molecular biology is so powerful that now you can type out the sequence of any DNA you want, except for maybe smallpox, you get in trouble for that. But you can type out any sequence you want, email it off to your favorite 
synthesis supplier, and they will get back in the mail the actual physical DNA. And you can insert that into microbes, and they will start reading it and producing the products of that DNA. But the real problem is we don't know what to compose. Because even though we figured out what is the relationship between the DNA sequence and, say, the polypeptide chain that that encodes, that we've known, the genetic code, we don't understand the next key steps in that. And that is, how does a protein sequence encode a three-dimensional structure? The so-called protein folding problem. Ages ago, when I was a graduate student, I was told, oh, that'll be solved in five years. Well, guess what? It's not. And the more we learn about it, the more complicated it is. But that's not even the problem that's interesting, right? It's the function problem. It is, what does that polypeptide chain do? And what does it do in detail that really matters? So we have still great big question marks on the chemical side of things that keeps us from that dream of composing DNA and rewriting the genetic code to convince organisms to stop doing what they normally do, which is make more organisms, and start making the, the products that we want. So um, fortunately, there is an algorithm by which the biological world can optimize, optimizes itself. And that algorithm, if you look at the proteins that exist today, and that'll be the subject of my talk, enzymes, if you look at the ones that exist today that have come through this process, this algorithm of mutation and natural selection, they're all beautifully tuned for the jobs that the organism wants them to do. And we know by building family trees that they can they came about from some common ancestor a long time ago and became finely tuned through this process, all well adapted. And humans can use this. So this is what I've been doing for the last 30 years, is trying to figure out how can we use this molecular level process to do what we've been doing for thousands of years. We have been modifying genomes, rewriting the genetic code through this same process without knowing anything about it at the molecular level. But imagine now, right? So we've been solving all sorts of human problems this way, especially in food, but also making things for our pleasure that may not be remotely natural in the sense that they wouldn't survive out in the natural world, but to solve human problems, either for useful things or for pleasurable things. So the real question becomes, can we use this same process, this same powerful biological design process, and marry it with the molecular tools that are now available to create these new solutions and, and organisms that will solve some of the dire uh, problems that we face now. So I implement evolution in the laboratory. And it becomes a problem not of thousands of years, but bringing it down to the time scale of a PhD thesis at the very least. Industry is not happy with that, so we have to get it much, much faster. And if it is an algorithm, truly, then we should be able to do that, and that's what's happening right now. So at the very simplest level, let me just introduce you to the idea of how you would evolve something at uh, a protein in the laboratory. But first, let me tell you that it's hard, because there are more ways that you can string together the amino acids that would make up a typical protein, 450 letters long, 20 letters in the alphabet, than there are by far particles in the universe. It's an enormous space that we can't even begin to comprehend. These numbers are greater than astronomical numbers, universal numbers. They're even greater than the US national debt. That's a really <laughs> big number. Yet, and not only that, I'll tell you, even though I've, I've explored just a tiny fraction of this space, I will categorically tell you that most of those sequences are totally useless. They don't fold, they don't function, and they don't do anything remotely related to what you would want to use for, to solve a problem. So we're searching a sequence space that's enormous and mostly empty. And it's an optimization problem in that space. But let me share with you 30 years of my own experience, plus many, many other laboratories that do this now, as well as some thoughtful people who realize that we are the products of this process. And therefore, it truly can't be that hard. And it's not that hard because this fitness landscape, this, these sequences in this sequence space, are distributed in a very important way. They're distributed so that their landscape, this optimization, this 
physical molecular optimization that we have to do happens on a smooth, largely smooth landscape for proteins. What that means that is if you make mutations, you don't necessarily kill a protein. And every once in a while, a random mutation can improve it, especially when you're asking the protein to do something new, to catalyze a new reaction. And your job becomes searching locally in this landscape to find those few improvements, very much like we've been doing by plant breeding and crop breeding. All right, so in the laboratory, students, your teenagers in high school can do these experiments. They're really very simple. The tools are already there to do it. At the simplest level, you take one of those rare sequences that catalyzes a desired reaction but needs to be improved, make copies of that using error-prone polymerase chain reaction, just copy the DNA under error-prone conditions, and you can make billions of versions of that DNA that have a controllable number of random mutations. Then biology does the hard part, right? It can take that DNA and translate that into proteins. You just add DNA to competent microbes. They'll take it up and start producing your enzymes. Then comes the hard part for the human, because I have to decide who lives and who dies in this experiment, who goes on to produce the next generation. So I have to laboriously sift through these or find some clever way to determine who has a mutation that's beneficial. And then, the vast majority, because most mutations take you downhill, but if you've asked the right kind of question, and this is really where all the taste lies in these experiments, if you've asked the right kind of question, you can find mutations that have a measurable beneficial effect. And the right kind of question is looking for a small change in the background of many things that don't have a change, where a single mutation can provide that beneficial effect, and then you iterate. You climb uphill on this fitness landscape little by little using an evolutionary approach. This works really well, and I, won't, I want to talk about completely new things that my laboratory is doing over the last couple of years, but I'll summarize 25 years of this field in many different laboratories in the following way. We have learned that enzymes, proteins, almost all biological molecules are highly evolvable. That is, you can morph their functions in desirable ways and undesirable ways through this iterative process, through this algorithm. This, and also using a strategy as simple as a random uphill walk because of the nature of the fact that we are the products of evolution, we can be modified by evolution. When I say we, I mean life, DNA. Furthermore, we find that new functions can appear very rapidly. This has been demonstrated in the laboratory. It's also demonstrated in the natural world, as I'll show you shortly. Just changing a very small fraction of the sequence, sometimes as few as one or two amino acids, can alter functions and optimize proteins in important ways. And for the would-be designers of biological catalysts, let me point out that many be beneficial mutations lie far from the site where catalysis happens in a protein. It all matters. Information can be transferred from 20, 30 angstroms away to have important effects on catalysis. We can't even explain those mutations, much less predict them. Yet we are blessed by having this incredible, powerful algorithm that circumvents our near complete ignorance of how the sequence determines function. So basically, this 25 years tells us we can optimize en enzyme function in desired ways to obtain catalysts that are useful for anything from personal care products to making new chemicals. But I told you I would talk about creating new enzymes. So this is something you might consider a much more difficult problem. How does an inherently conservative process like this, where you're just taking a mutation at a time, which is important because there's so many ways to make even two mutations, millions and millions of ways to make two mutations to a protein that we can't efficiently search through this process. So technically, we're limited to this evolutionary 
search of accumulating beneficial mutations. But how does a conservative process like that create novelty? How do you get whole new chemistry out of a system through a single mutational walk? And that question flummoxed me for a number of years. And I got, um, I think, jealous by listening to the chemists and, and, and the designers, people like David Baker, who would sit down and compute a protein, for example, that might bind a transition state and catalyze a whole new reaction that nature had never seen before, albeit poorly, but still be able to obtain that new protein function. Surely, evolutionary processes can do that because evolution has been doing that. How do you collapse that to a short period of time? How do we evolve enzymes that catalyze reactions that have not happened in the biological world? All right, it, to me, it's kind of the speciation problem, right? We know that species have come about by this gradual process, but it's hard to catch nature in the act, right? So we have very little understanding of the details at the molecular level of how this novelty is created. When did we diverge from our ape ancestors, and how did those, what steps were there? We don't have a fossil record for that. Likewise, we don't have a fossil record for that in the enzyme world. We know that all these proteins came about from common ancestors to not just be different in details, but to catalyze whole new reactions. How can we repeat that? So let me tell you a very short story of real-time evolution of, of an enzyme activity. You think of atrazine, a potent herbicide that's been on this planet made by humans for only about 50 years or 60 years now. It was considered non-biodegradable and accumulated in the soil. But then all of a sudden, something happened. Around 1993, it started being biodegraded. Somebody out there figured out how to catalyze the degradation of this, starting with the removal of the chlorine. And with some clever work by uh, Larry Wackett's group, they identified that this was catalyzed by an enzyme called ATZA, atrazine chlorohydrolase. And not only that, they identified that it most likely came from an ancestor that's very closely related. So this is like saying, try A, you are the father here, because your sequence looks a lot, or you are a very close relative, right? That's your smoking gun. So in this case, this came from a melamine deaminase, catalyzes a somewhat different reaction, but it had such close sequence identity that it was almost caught in the act. This happened in the natural world, but we could identify what this is. Science could do it. <clears throat> so an important principle that we learned. The introduction of synthetic compounds, compounds not present in the biological world or it, in a completely different place, can drive the evolution of this novel activity. Furthermore, when studying the putative father and the new enzyme, it was realized that they had residual capabilities. That is, ATZA could deaminate melamine, which also is a man-made product, and the melamine deaminase had a little bit of activity. And so that what happened with evolution is that mutations accumulated to take this promiscuous activity of the ancestor and grab it and turn it into this new catalyst. All right, so that gives us ideas. But one thing it should give us respect for, and I seem to be missing my graphic here, um, is that nature is out there solving problems 24-7, billions of little microbes, trillions, gazillions of microbes are out there working hard to solve chemical problems and pre produce novelty. And to me, this is the ultimate internet of things. This is the internet of living things. So everybody is out there working to solve their problems. Let's see if we can grab this for our own problem solving. So my favorite enzyme of the last few decades is an enzyme that can do things even Caltech chemists can't do. Caltech chemists are pretty darn good chemists, but they can't insert oxygen into an unactivated CH bond at room temperature and pressure in water. This enzyme, acetochrome P450, of which you have more than 50 
in your own body, where they're the first line of defense against some of the noxious things that you ingest, this enzyme can take an oxygen from dioxygen and insert it into a CH bond. Pretty impressive. Not only that, so it does this, it does this using a heme cofactor, really nice modular system, iron catalyst, abundant, safe, and it can activate oxygen, making it very hot so that it becomes reactive enough to do this insertion, yet the enzyme doesn't chew itself up. That's pretty glorious catalysis. And it's a member of a very large family. The cytochrome P450 family not only catalyzes that reaction, but it catalyzes a whole slew of other reactions. So here's an example of where nature took one enzyme and turned it into a family of different, very powerful catalysts. Everything from the hydroxylation, epoxidation, sulfoxidation, can dealkylate, it can decarboxylate, and even recently it was discovered it can catalyze direct nitration, direct nitration of tryptophan, for example. So here's the example of where a whole family of new catalysts, but it took hundreds of millions of years. If you look a little deeper into how nature did this, how did nature innovate in this way, and you look at the catalytic mechanism, which I will not drag you through, even though it's fascinating, because this enzyme, as I told you, has to create a hot oxygen and insert that into an unactivated bond without chewing itself up, and it does this through gating a whole series of electron and proton transfers. But I want to point out some of these intermediates. It cre actually creates a series of reactive intermediates. And those reactive intermediates are what nature has grabbed. So if you think of this atrazine example, there's this inherent capability in a protein to do things that it's not being asked to do at the time. Right? You're thinking an enzyme is for this in a particular place in 2015. But in 2020, its side capabilities become the fodder, the fuel for evolution to adapt to new demands. It's like me looking at you and saying, you could be an Olympic Taekwondo champion. You say, who me? I don't know, I have it in me. But then my job as the trainer or the breeder of enzymes is to pull that capability out. But just as important is to recognize that capability. So nature recognized that capability because all of these reactive intermediates in the mechanism are what nature pulled off to create these new activities in this super family of catalysts. So blue, oops, sorry. I think I just pressed the wrong button. How do I get it started again? Sorry? Oh, push it again, great. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, we have, we have all these fantastic capabilities where the blue intermediate, that's the guy that got pulled off to do nitration. And our pink intermediates, those are the ones that get pulled off to do uh, CC bond breakage. And of course, famous compound one gets to do the epoxidation and the hydroxylations. So we have these new intermediates. This gave me uh, an, an idea. If biological, milieu and natural selection is what gave rise to the current superfamily of P450 catalysts through this zoo of intermediates that this enzyme makes. Perhaps we could expand the reaction space by making it make yet more intermediates. And here the inspiration can come from a vast literature of biomimetic chemists who tried to create catalysts that would mimic these enzymes and then discovered things like heme can catalyze reactions that are not known in the biological world, things like cyclopropanations. So for example, this uh, carbene, an iron carbonoid intermediate, is known in heme chemistry and can insert carbon at a double bond to make a cyclopropane. Why couldn't an enzyme do the same thing? Could we get an enzyme and use this synthetic reagent that would drive this, something like a, a, a diazoacetate reagent, and directed evolution to optimize that. 
So that was the question. Could we expand the reaction space by expanding the reactive intermediates? Can a P450 do this? Can you form this new intermediate in the active site of the enzyme? And most importantly, does that become the fodder for further evolution and diversification into a whole family of catalysts tuned for the selectivities and activities that you want? So Pedro Coelho and Eric Brustad, a uh, remarkable student postdoc in the laboratory, just tried this simple well-known reaction with styrene and ethyl diazoacetate in water using various heme proteins and found that, yes, heme can do it poorly, cytochrome C can do it, myoglobin can do it, and even a P450 can do it with a few total turnover numbers. Now, you might be tempted 20 years ago to walk away and, and just wash your hands of it, say, okay, it does it, does it very poorly. But remember, we now have all these tools at our hand to take a small, promiscuous activity and turn it into something beautiful. So in fact, Pedro found that even though the P450 did it most poorly, it did it with selectivity that was unlike the free cofactor. This told us this was happening inside the active site of the enzyme. And I know that the P450 is highly evolvable because I've taken it in lots of places. Nature already took it. But we found that we could also evolve these non-natural activities. So you make a single mutation, for example, in a key active site residue, and you can increase the activity almost two orders of magnitude. Not only that, you get beautiful selectivities. This is what enzymes are famous for. Here we could get 99% as the trans uh, product with perfect, almost perfect enantioselectivity. That gets pretty exciting. Another mute set of mutations can take you to the disfavored cis diastereomers, and then you also get good enantioselectivity with that. So we can tune the active site to direct the chemistry the way we want. Okay, I told you I wanted to make genetically encoded catalysts, expand the space of nature's chemical repertoire enabling new metabolic pathways, for example. This means it has to work in vivo, and if you looked at any of the reagents that I listed on the previous slide, you might say, wow, that's gonna be a little bit hard. Dithionite, for example, is not remotely a biological reagent. It kind of melts uh, cells, and they're very unhappy with that. Why do we have to use dithionite? The active form of this enzyme is in the iron II state. It has to be reduced. But P450s don't get reduced to iron II in vivo because they're gated. They have to have their substrate there before that ki critical key step happens. But we're not doing hydroxylation anymore. We're not inserting oxygen. In fact, we want to get oxygen out of there. We want to insert other atoms here. So we had to build a version of this enzyme that would be reduced by endogenous reductants like NADPH, and that means we could go in and modify this catalyst by changing out the critical cysteine that always ligates the heme in a P450 and replace it with something that would alter the redox potential. This something in the first example was serine. No longer does its natural reaction. But this enzyme folds. It's perfectly uh, expressed in E. coli, so there's no problem with that. In fact, you can see its structure. Serine ligates the heme. There's no measurable change in the three-dimensional structure of the protein. And in fact, it's no longer even a P450, right? It has no SORE band at 450 nanometers. In fact, it's a sickly green color, which led many people who had looked at these kind of mutants in the past to say, oh, it's dead. Well, it's not dead. This is a completely new enzyme with a single amino acid change that becomes a catalyst that is the most efficient, or one, almost the most efficient catalyst for these cyclopropanation reactions that has ever been reported. Dirhodium catalysts uh, are about the same kinds of activities, Seven, almost 70,000 turnover numbers for this particular reaction and in a number of other reactions. So the enzyme adapted with a single change to catalyze a whole new function. I keep asking my audiences, am I the mother of a whole new family of enzymes. Depends on whether you're an evolutionist. The evolutionist says, no, it's the same enzyme because it only has one mutation. The chemists say, oh, yeah, that's a completely different enzyme. So it, the answer uh, depends on who the 
who's answering it. In any case, this becomes the beginning of a new enzyme family because now you can do things like do uh, prep level synthesis of pharmaceutical intermediates that have cyclopropane groups. So here, for example, this levomonasoprine, nantiomerically pure drug, FDA approved. Uh, this one can be made at prep scales with a version of this enzyme that we modified by evolving the active site for this particular, uh, this particular product. Uh, and we were able to do that in the course of just a few weeks. So you can now start creating selective versions of the enzyme for your favorite cyclopropanation. Once you've got an iron carbonoid, you can do all sorts of cool new chemistry with that. Just go thumb through the old versions of JAX, and you can even a, a chemical engineer like myself can get some good ideas. For example, you can do OH insertions, CH insertions, uh, NH insertions, as well as the cyclopropanation. You could probably think of a few more yourself. Once you've got a good thing going, though, why stop there? I love to beat things into the ground. So once you've got a cyclopropanation catalyst or carbonoid, why not do something like a nitrinoid? Maybe a cytochrome P450 could insert nitrogen in a biological system, do direct uh, emanation. Biology doesn't do that for some reason. It takes roundabout routes but do a direct CH emanation using an enzyme. That would mean you'd have to form an iron nitrinoid intermediate, but uh, azide uh, reagents can do that. And John McIntosh showed a couple years ago now that with a particular intramolecular CH emanation, the enzyme would actually do this reaction. Not only that, it does it really poorly, and this had actually been reported 30 years ago, but nobody ever followed up on it because now we can evolve that. If you have a small amount of promiscuous activity, it becomes the fodder for evolution. So just a few mutations, and you can start improving this activity as well. And you can do hard things, right? The enzyme does these reactions selectively. You can target CH bonds that are much less reactive because the active site will direct that chemistry. So Todd Heister asked, can I do this particular emanation at the unfavored uh, 98 kilocalorie per mole bond and, and make the, uh, make the six-membered ring over the five-membered ring. And he showed that, in fact, one set of mutations will do that, will make the five-membered ring, which is favored, but a different set of mutations will, in fact, direct it very selectively to the stronger CH bond, just proving that the enzyme is evolvable and can do this interesting new chemistry. Well, of course, nobody cares about making these particular products. Oh, actually, let me take 30 seconds to, again, instill fear into the hearts of the would-be designers. We can get crystal structures of these evolved enzymes out. And very often, they tell us, as I told you before, mutations happen far away. But we also get interesting solutions like this. So here's an example of this key, of a key mutation in this highly um, selective enzyme where the rotomer was in a, such a disfavored state for, for this phenylalanine mutation, it wouldn't even be in the library of rotomers that the designers would use. So this is a solution that would never come up. It, we see this over and over again. So once we've got that, then we could optimize these enzymes, getting more and more powerful and more and more difficult reactions. So we go from cyclopropanations to CH insertions to aminations. We find the key mutations that promote those at the axial ligand and elsewhere. And we can start doing more and more difficult reactions. So more interesting would be intermolecular nitrine transfers. And uh, since I don't have any remaining time, I'll just point out that we've been able to do and have published sulfimidations now and azeridination, direct azeridination. That's not a reaction that nature's ever explored, as far as I know. I haven't found any aziridination catalysts out there. Nature makes aziridines, but through totally different routes. But here's a way you can do it uh, directly inside of, of living cells. So I used my time to try to pr promote this idea that you have this mechanism for true innovation that can happen through mutations if you can guide it in the right way. And this is where the creativity lives for the human. 
for the breeder, right, is to recognize who should be the parent, what are the uh, functional capabilities that are accessible through this algorithm. And then with synthetic reagents and directed evolution, you can start exploring many new chemical reactivities. I argue that this is the most powerful design process for biology and that we should, make, we should embrace it and make use of it. Geneticists don't have any problem with this. They all say, oh, what's the big deal? Of course you would use evolution. But this is not necessarily the case in the chemical world where there seems to be this push for design first. And if I can't design it, it's not worth making. These processes are really elegant. and They work. And uh, that way we can expand the world of biocatalysis into whole new arenas where chemistry has had the only play. So I'll thank you for your attention and thank my wonderful group who did all this work. BASF, we create chemistry.